Welcome to the Bureau of Historical Society meeting at the Hatmatash Playhouse, which we have humorously entitled Hatmatash in three hats. Um, so I have just a couple of announcements. The restaurant is going to be right up here at the end, at the end of the uh, theater. If you've been to the theater before, you know where they are. And there's a sign out there, you just go up and flag still and walk across, across the gravel driveway and you're there. Uh, a couple of announcements of items that are coming up uh, on uh, Monday, June 12th at 7 o'clock at the Dover Public Library. Information Director and I think she's head librarian. Kathy Bowden is giving a lecture on how to trace the history of your house, especially if you live in the Dover area. But I'm sure uh, what she's going to talk about will be of interest to anyone who wants to trace back the history of the, your house. You may have a different county system of probate and uh, registry courts to go through but the mechanics of it will be the same. So that's uh, Monday night, uh, June 12th at 7 o'clock, Dover Public Library. It's in Foster's. I'm sure you can Google it at Dover Public Library. And then in South Dover, on June 17th, a week from today, There'll be a historic encampment at the county house or right below the county house on the river. It will include uh, the Musket Du Roy of Montreal, a French Canadian reenactor who will be presenting what it was like for the people of the 17th century living on the frontier which this area was the cutting edge part of it between the Indians and the French and the English. That will be uh, next week at 2. And I believe there's also uh, uh, on the opposite side of the river at the uh, Paul Wentworth house, which we toured earlier this year, uh, a reenactment by some in Penobscot Indian reenactors. So that will be a, probably quite an exciting event. Today we are here to pay homage and respect to this institution in Berwick, which is now entering its 45th year, the Hackmatack Playhouse. It has a history that predates that by many years. And we're gathered here in this building, which was part of the original farm. And it's a part of living history. It's still a farm. It's a farm that's morphed into a summer theater, but they now have a new agricultural project going here, which will get more information on later at the end of the program the Buffalo Project. So this is the kind of quintessential agricultural entity in Berwick that takes its place along with other farms such as Tearshirt Farm, where our member Peter Cook raises historic breeds of animals, or Dr. Adam's old place down the road here on Route 9 where they're raising alpacas. You have these historic farms that are still a vital part of the community, still exist as farms and help preserve the beautiful landscape that we enjoy here in the road. So it's with great thanks and gratitude that uh, I thank the 
uh, Michael Gupto for make, and, and his son Connor for making this available to us today. And because I speak too much or am accused of doing the same, I've decided to cut it short today and I've asked my good friend, Theater credit, musician of multiple arts, person, plus introduce Michael I promise in a few minutes but I just need a little time here to set the, uh, the background for this okay I've learned a few important lessons during my many years of involvement in this magical place we call Hackmatack Playhouse all of them while well, either on stage off stage or in the pit orchestra as a flute player <coughs> Carl's dream as we used to call it and some still do is a place where dreams really have come true for countless actors off-stage personnel, volunteers, and audiences in the course of more than four decades of existence here at Berwick. We're more than fortunate to have this theater in our town, and maybe on a day like this, it's doubly impressive that it's here for us to come to. Of course, as with life itself, things don't always go smoothly in the world of live theater, and that goes for Hackmatack, too. Uh, here, then, for your instruction and amusement, are a few of the more memorable lessons that either I or others have learned while applying the boards here at Hackmatack. I'll let you decide for yourself which ones have my name written all over them. I thought it'd be kind of funny to do uh, what we've seen on late night television in the past. We will list the five in order of their scary uh, <laughs> realities. Uh, so number six, right? If you ever get cast in the role of a sailor in a production of Mr. Roberts, that's the sailor whose job it is to open the show by coming up out of the hatch in pitch dark, always come up when the light cue tells you to, not five agonizing, humiliating minutes before the show actually begins. <laughs> that be me, right? <laughs> Number five, never sweat blood learning two contrasting monologues for an audition, then forget every last word of them in front of a cattle call audition of 50 Portland area theater professionals. I promise you, it will not be good for your self-esteem as an actor. Still talking to that guy right here. Right? And I, I wanted to interject this note. I went home so crushed, so humiliated, that I could remember none of my autologues that I thought this was the end of my career. I got a call the next night, night and said, a guy from Portland, he said, you know, we really like what you did. And I said, what did I do? Nothing. And he said, oh, no, no, we like your style. We like you come down and audition for a play. There's a message in that, right? And believe in yourself, right? It was, it was amazing. And I got cast in a play, one of the biggest roles I've ever had. So it was a happy one. Number four, don't ever agree to work on late night set building sessions if the only song your supervisor will allow on the sound system over and over and over again is YMCA. <laughs> this happened here. I think we worked four hours a shift and we heard YMCA <laughs> over and over again because the supervisor loved it. Number three, new, never assume a magazine editor has your best interest in mind when preparing your article for publication. That way, you won't go into septic shock when the article you so lovingly created, the story of Hackmatack Playhouse in the Gupto Homestead, shows up in your neighborhood newsstand as hijinks in a cow barn. <laughs> <laughs> that shut me down. I didn't want to write another magazine article for years after that. Yeah, I was angry because I really had put my heart and soul into that 
article, and I wanted the story of the homestead to be get equal billing with the story of the theater. They're inseparable. But anyway, okay. <laughs> and number two, I bet you're wondering what number one is. Always check to make sure you put your pants back on after a performance night costume change. <laughs> Does anyone remember who didn't remember? John Edmonds. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, he was way over there on stage, right? But a lot of the actors knew and saw. And number one, drum roll please, never leave your lapel mic on while visiting the bathroom between performance night scenes. <laughs> that has happened many times, I've been told. Well then. So now, about the man who is surely one of the most important reasons we're gathered here this afternoon. Anyone who's lived in these parts for even a few years knows the name Gupto is almost universally known in and well beyond the Berwicks. Among those who know the name, it is always respected, and that name will always and forever be connected with Hackman Tech Playhouse and everything it stands for. I say almost universally because there is one place on the planet that refuses to acknowledge the existence of the name Gothel at all. It's a great mystery to me. I've written about Hackman Tech in many circumstances over the years, but every time I try to type the word Gothel on my MacBook Air, it always comes out nutshell. <laughs> and U-P-T-I-A-L. I practically have to beat it with a stick to get it to fix it and put it back to Gupto. Unfortunately, I have yet to figure out how to divorce myself from Spellcheck. And as you all know, Spellcheck has a mind of its own. I need to educate them about the Gupto family. But enough about Spellcheck. We're here to talk about theater, especially theater has been produced here in Berwick for really an astonishing 45 consecutive years. Anyone who follows the theater world at any level from small town to London and Broadway knows that a lot of theaters never make it beyond the third year. So this is an enormous accomplishment uh, to have this here after all those years. Very few theaters anywhere can claim to have achieved such longevity, especially because anyone who spent time in the world of professional theater knows it's chock full of behavioral landmines of the sort I just described to you. Moments both on and off stage when all of what you've worked so hard to bring to life falls apart in your hands like an underbaked brownie. Carl Gupto knew it. Sharon Hilton, the previous artistic director, uh, by the way, a woman who has the very blood of Hack Patek in her veins from years of involvement, she knew it. The current artistic director, Crystal Lisbon, who, did I know, mispronounce that? Crystal Lisbon, who's as gifted at choreography as she is at putting a production together and making it sing, she actively knows it. She's in the middle of it right now. But for the past several years now, it has fallen to Carl's son, Michael, the executive director here at The Hack, to pull an entire theater company together and make it running smoothly in one long, hard-driving summer. And if anyone knows what can sometimes go maddeningly, hysterically wrong in the course of the season, it would be Mike. So now it's time to let Mike up to do the talking. Like his father before him, he can't help to have, but have a lot and a lot of stories so it's my pleasure and our pleasure to hear him share them with you. Thank you. I do, before I get started, I thought I would uh, just share this. There's a picture of my dad in rehearsals, and you might notice a guy in the back row. Oh. <laughs> a beard. Was it young? Yeah. Young Ross Batchel. Yeah. 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 Pass that around? Yeah. I get a lot of stuff to pass around. I'll just pass it right through here. Somebody in the back row can collect it. So uh, thanks for coming. I thought I would sing a song to get going. This is a song that that uh, is passed down through the generations of Guptals. <coughs> I know Connie, you know this song, but just in case, you better make sure you pay attention. Yeah. You can teach it to Lewis. On a dark stormy night, when the train rattled, traveled on, all the passengers had gone to bed, except one young man with a babe in his arms, who sat there with a bowed down head. The innocent one began crying just then, as though his poor heart would break. One angry man said, make that child stop its noise, for it's keeping all of us awake. <laughs> Put it out, said another, don't keep it in here. We pay for our births and want rest. 
But never a word said the man with the child as he fondled it close to his breast. Where is its mother? Go take it to her. As a lady then softly said, <coughs> I wish that I could, was the man's sad reply. But she's dead in the coach ahead. <laughs> While the train rolled onward, the husband sat in tears, thinking of the happiness of just a few short years. For baby's face brings pictures of a cherished hope now dead. And baby's cries can't waken her in the baggage coach ahead. That's a song typical of uh, like the 1880s, 1890s. One that uh, my great grandfather Granville uh, may have passed along to my great great grandfather Samuel, and then his son Lewis, my dad Samuel, who taught it to me. And uh, I know I've sung it many times to Connor and my other children. You remember, don't you, Connor? I think we sang it in the show a few years ago, didn't we? Yeah, sure. And uh, now I expect him to pass it along to the next generation. And that's what we seem to do here uh, in the Guptful Homestead. We pass along um, songs, we pass along stories, we pass along buildings, uh, pass along uh, our tax bills to the next generation. <laughs> But um, this, this uh, farm here has been in our family since the late 1600s. I'm not really sure exactly when. There was a fellow by the name of Thomas Gubtail that landed in Portsmouth in the uh, 1600s. He um, s sooner or later settled up here in uh, Berwick. And my father would say that we have the oldest house in Berwick. Do you know, Don, where is the oldest house supposed to be? I know there was one on uh, Old Pine Hill Road, supposed to be the oldest. Well, the one that is reputed to be the oldest apparently has the remnant of what used to be Master uh, John Sullivan's schoolhouse incorporated into it. So in that respect, it would probably qualify as older than this. Well, it, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to argue because I really don't, my dad would argue with you, but I won't be. Well, I wouldn't argue with you. I, I really don't know either. I do know this though, when the um, settlers settled in Berwick um, and the whole area here, most of the settlers came from the eastern area of England. And if you look on your map, you find that there's, an Eng there's a Berwick, England, in the eastern part of England, that's where the pilgrims came from, and the uh, the pure many of the Puritans, the pilgrims. I I know that my family had that kind of stock. Yeah, right. I visited Berwick, England. Well, I was over there. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Sometimes it was Berwick, Scotland. And is yeah, it Berwick, Scotland too? too. Oh, it, was the same place. Oh. it went. Okay, you yeah, can right on that, right on that. Okay. All right, well, you guys know more about the history of Berwick, England, Scotland than I do. But um, the people in that area were very into spirits and very into uh, things, evil things that would attack their houses. And in fact, this was the main group of people that you know, settled in Salem, Massachusetts. And one, one thing they would do in their houses is to put shoes in the walls. You would put a shoe over the window and over the um, over the doorway of a house, and that in the chimney area of a house. And this would stop the evil spirits from coming through the chimneys, the, wall, the, the, the windows. And when we did some massive renovation to our house a few years ago, you guys, many of you remember when we did that, we found these shoes in the, in the walls. And if you, um, if you take a look, do, do you mind? You can pass them. They're a little bit dirty. You might get your hands dirty. 
Um, but if you look at the um, the stitching and the way the shoes are made, we brought these once to a to a to a shoe expert, a shoe historical expert, and and they were dated from the maybe 16, 1700s. So I'm not exactly sure when they who put them in the wall and. and and uh, why I think if you look at some of the other houses, if you have a very old house in, in Berwick or wherever you live, you might find a shoe like this in your house. <laughs> so anyways, that was Thomas Gubtail. Uh, back in the 1700s, early 1800s, I'm not really sure if any of our uh, ancestors, I mean, I, I, I don't know of any ancestors that fought in the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. But I do have this little piece of uh, uh, this uh, puzzle form that is from our house. We have a lot of uh, things in the house that have been passed down from year to year to year. And when you have houses that are passed over generations and generations, you collect all this stuff. <laughs> don't know what to do with it. But this is a nice little piece. And you notice this, there's, a, uh, there's an initial one. And you won't be able to see it probably because of the light in here. It's a WH. If you look really hard, you can see the WH, which is William Guptel, and you'll see a date on this. You can see the date pretty easily, which is uh, 1795. So, that's a nice piece. And there, I pulled a cork. Don't. I suggest you don't pull the cork because there is a gunpowder in there and it gets all over you. But um, that's an interesting piece. Uh, Don. Don entitled this. Uh, Don entitled this uh, talk, Hackmatack in Three Acts. I'm going to talk a lot about the family, then get into the Hackmatack itself. And then uh, later on, Connor will talk about the bison. So, but if you have questions along the way, I'd love, I'd love to, uh, love to uh, tackle them. Um, the building that you're sitting in is one of the original barns on the property. The house is the oldest building, and I it dates from the late 1600s. Uh, there's there's uh, two different parts of the house, as you can see, two different little capes that was put together. So the original cape was on this side, uh, and then uh, a newer cape was on the other side. A few years ago, my wife and I, when we moved into this house after my, my father passed away, did a big renovation on the oldest side. Didn't have much of a foundation. Had a had a root cellar, but the rest of the cellar was just on some uh, stone. It was falling all apart, frankly, and it, we just had to spend some money on it to take care of it. Uh, and, and you know, there's the story of the man who inherited the uh, axe from his uh, great grandfather. You might have heard this story. Uh, his uh, great grandfather uh, gave it to his grandfather, who broke the handle, so his grandfather fixed the handle and passed the axe down to the, uh, the father. The father, you know, he was axing, he was uh, cutting one day, and the head blew away, he couldn't find it, so he put a new head on it, so then he passed the axe on to his, his child. Is it the same axe? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. I don't know if it's the same axe or not. Same with a uh, house, we've done a lot of renovations on the house. Is it the same house? I think it is. It's in the same location. Uh, but there's a lot of changes over the years. You can see in this uh, photo that I'll pass around, this is from probably the late 1890s uh, or so, maybe around the turn of the 1900th century. You can see the two different sections of the house, sort of. You see on the left-hand side or the right-hand side the building that you're sitting in right now. This, is, this building here is one of the, or the original uh, barn. Um, we, when I was growing up here, we called it the woodshed. Now most people call it the rehearsal barn. If you look right above the Don's head, you'll see a big wheel up there. You see the wheel? That's where my uh, one of our ancestors would uh, would haul cattle up and, and uh, you know let the let the blood drain or whatever. Uh, we used to when I was younger, or when my father was younger, we there'd be all sorts of things drying up there. Uh, we come to uh, my the first person that really started 
that I know of that was started an interest in music was my great great grandfather, whose name was Granville Gupta. And uh, Granville, it was about the time that Granville was around that we, that the second part of the house was put on. Uh, this was around, this was mid 18, between 1860 and 1880, that sort of, that sort of time period. I have a book here which, uh, if you haven't seen before, some of you guys are really interested in historical records. This is the uh, biographical review of uh, all the important people in your county. And it's interesting just to flip through the book and see some of the names that you would know in North Berwick, the Herds and, and the Buffums. And, you know, you go through York and, you know, you know that some of the settlers in York. And, uh, it's interesting to find their, their names in this book. But uh, I can read you a little bit about my great-great-grandfather, Granville. Uh, it says that uh, it, it has other, uh, talks a little bit about other guptals as well. And most of them, they say, were just uh, very upstanding and industrious farmers. Uh, not sure what that means, it means that they worked all day, I think. Uh, but uh, it says that uh, uh, Granville had many occupations, including carpen carpentering and milling. And uh, in his spare hours, he was engaged in building carriages, wagons, sleighs, and the like. <coughs> Excuse me. His self skillfulness in the handling of tools is exhibited in several violins, which he has made in the evenings. They are beautiful instruments with a tone which is uh, pronounced to be uh, by experienced musicians as excellent. So there you go, excellent violin. And here's some of his violin uh, equipment. Uh, I'm just kind of pass this around. Just kind of interesting to see. He uh, would sit in our house and make the violins. Uh, I don't know if you want to go past that now. This, this is other material that's in the house that we just kind of don't know what to do with, so we save it. I'll notice, too, uh, I have a picture here somewhere. Uh, Connor. House and get the picture of the uh, the slide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on this is a uh, this is another picture taken a little bit during that time period. And two or three things to to note in this in this photograph, uh, you can see pretty clearly the two sections of the house, the older and the newer section. You see one of my great grand relatives. I have not, no idea who it is. But also notice the barn in the back. This is the barn that uh, uh, burnt down in the in uh, 1928, uh, which I, I bring to your attention because my dad would always uh, would always talk about this 1928 fire. He was uh, uh, trying to think it was 28 or 38, I've forgotten. He was 10 years old at the time. What's my dad for? 28, I think he's one 28. Yeah, 28. So it was a 1938 fire. And he uh, he always talked about how the fire, uh, how there was a very hot summer night and uh, they, had, they had just loaded hay in the barn and the hay just wasn't dry enough and exploded. And uh, it was it was a big thunder uh, shower that night as well. It was just very very humid conditions, and the bomb went up in a roaring fire. And uh, you know that he would always tell the story that it affected him quite a bit when he was 10 years old. And we never knew just how much to believe, anyways, uh, from my dad. But but that is. Uh, I, I, I bring that story up because just maybe seven years ago, uh, I was at, I was 
greeting people after the intermission of a show. And um, one old fella came up to me and introduced himself. And he said he hadn't, this is the last time he was here was at the fire. I said, what fire? He says, when the mine burned down. I, I, you were here when the mine burned down? It, he, he was visiting his uncle in two farms over. And uh, he was also 10 years old at the time. And uh, it was a night just like my father said. And the barn kind of exploded and went up in flames. And of course, if you were a 10 year old at the time, this would have been pretty exciting. So he came over here to watch the fire. And, uh, and then he went back to Connecticut or wherever he was from. And next time he came back was like seven years ago. I was like, that's an amazing story. But uh, my uh, great grandfather's name was Samuel Gupto. In fact, uh, we have many Samuel Guptos in our, in our uh, lineage. Every other generation has a Samuel in it. So it gets a little confusing when you try to track generation to generation. But uh, this, my great grandfather Samuel, uh, decided to move out of this house and he built the big yellow house that's on the other side of us over here. Uh, he decided he was going to have uh, uh, an, a dance hall. And so he built the house, built the barn, and uh, put a dance hall upstairs in the barn. Uh, there's never been any animals in that barn except for some stray cats, probably a few stray mice. But uh, if you go upstairs in that barn now, my, my nephew lives there. Uh, there's a big dance hall with a nice oak floor. In fact, if you go on the other side of that house, if you'll see a set of stairs that goes up when my, when my uh, nephew took over the house, he had to take, there was a big balcony there, and they cut off the balcony because it kind of rotted out. But at the bottom of the staircase, built right into the house, was a ticket booth. So that, that was, uh, you don't see too many families that build a house with a ticket booth. Uh, but that house was built with a ticket booth, and upstairs is a dance hall, and he would have dances there every Saturday night. Uh, maybe my great-grandfather, Bando, would play the violin. I'm not really sure. But I do know that my grandfather, um, Louis Gupto, got very interested in music, and uh, perhaps that's where he got interested in music. Now, all this time, my, my family would also be farming. We also had mills around. Uh, they, they were carpenters, but more than carpenters, they were millers. They had uh, a lot of uh, lumber mills. And uh, over the years, we had lumber mill. We had, uh, in fact, that building that we'll, we'll tour in a few minutes, uh, that was built as a finished mill for my grandfather, by my grandfather. And then uh, my great Granville built mills. We had a mill across the street where the Beaver Dam, Beaver Dam uh, campground is now. Uh, we, had, we had a mill on the property out in the woods. And my great grandfathers had mills all over the place in, in Berwick and in North Berwick. But uh, my uh, grandfather was also very interested in music and uh, also was very interested in the Grange. Now, some of you I know very familiar with the Grange. Anybody not familiar with the Grange? And, how important the Grange was during the uh, 1800s and 1900s. Not maybe as important as it once was, but uh, my uh, grandfather uh, started the uh, Beaver Dam Grange, and music was a big part of that Grange, a uh, big part of any Grange. And he went around, the, went around the state starting bands, and I have a picture of him, as a matter of fact, in one of the bands that he started in North Berlin. And you can see my grandfather's in the, the back row, the second one to the uh, on the left. And maybe some of you, Nancy, maybe you know some of these names. Other people in the Northburg, the Northburg Cadet Band. Yeah. Yes, sir. Would that have been the Bonnie Bag Lane? Uh, well, he was involved with Bonnie Bag, but that was a Beaver Dam Grange, a different branch. Oh. Yeah. Right. The Beaver Dam Grange was uh, it's gone now, burnt down, maybe. Uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago. So on the top of the hill behind the, the uh, Clement's house, uh, at the end of the end of Randall Road, uh, it was a nice, nice old building, and like like the, all the Granges were. Uh, 
So my grandfather would start bands all over the all over the state, and he also would maybe be involved in some minstrel shows, and uh, that's kind of where my dad got interested in theater, was from going to the Grange meetings and uh, and then watching the minstrel shows and watching the the the, the comedy, especially the uh, you always love the the kind of wacky comedy that some of these minstrel shows would do. Uh, that was his. His forte, his, his Ross will tell you, the kind of stupid comics, even long after a He was great at directing those. So um, this was, uh, my dad uh, was served in, uh, after he went to Berlin High School, he went to the Navy, served, uh, he actually served as a, uh, as a, uh, uh, a naval, uh, he was just a sailor, but he, he, uh, he served on Harry Truman's yacht as uh, as his, one of his um, the guys on the yacht <laughs> take care of uh, Harry when he was on the yacht but when he came home he uh, went to went to uh, University of Maine to study agriculture and uh, he was just kind of bored with studying agriculture so he uh, started taking theater courses and theater running into the theater program then he came back uh, to Berwick to run the farm and uh, he also participated in, uh, uh, he started theaters all over the area early on in uh, his career. He, uh, but we, he put on shows at churches, at schools, any kind of group that wanted him to, to do, a, uh, do a show, he would do a show. He had a, a, a theater group at the, at the Grange called the Beaver Dam Little Theater, who also ran in Summersworth for quite a while. This here is a photograph of, I think it's a, a, a Berwick Centennial of some kind. I don't know if there's anybody around that can remember this event. I think it, how old is Berwick? Anybody tell me? 340 years. 340? Four. 304, this might have been the 250th. Uh, yeah. Do you remember this event? Okay, this is the girl I may know. She may have been in it. <laughs> she may be one of the people photographed there. I don't think I see the best people that I know. <laughs> this is, um, my dad directed um, some kind of, it looks like uh, like the history of Berwick that he probably wrote. Uh, and I noticed there's a few black people there, which maybe weren't part of the history of Berwick. He decided to, to enlighten us a little bit. Uh, you'll notice there's uh, people in blackface, there's dead people, there's Indians, all sorts of uh, all sorts of activities that went on in Berwick that you didn't even know about. That would be my father's style. He's the one holding the flag in the middle of the photograph, which would be his style as well. Yes, ma'am. Can I have your name, please? <laughs> uh, during the Second World War, yeah. your dad organized a, a, a dance band. And my dad or my grandfather? My dad? Your, your grandfather. My grandfather. Boy, you know. Yeah. And he played the violin. Yeah. And I just got to the violin. I played the drums because she could play the piano better than I did. Priscilla Lord played uh, uh, street box. And Richard Stillings played the street box. Very good. And we used to go every Saturday night in the range of Yeah, that was my, my grandfather. Yes, yeah. Louis. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's that's very typical. Yeah. I run into people all the time of your age, right? Yeah, of my age. Uh, that I remember playing in a band with uh, my, he, he would play, my grandfather would play the violin, he played the tuba, played the piano, uh, probably played something else too. And he did this all with um, missing two of his fingers because he cut them off in a, in, a, in a sawing accident. Most guys that ran lumber mills very long were missing digits on their fingers. So anyways, uh, but he can still play the tuba and play the, I, I'm not even sure, I, I remember him doing it, but uh, at the time I was too young to, uh, to remember a whole lot of how we did that. There's a hackman thing. Yes, sir, Nancy. Are they out on the black? 
people in here, yeah. uh, the morals and found in Northborough uh -huh. in the late 1600s had slaves. Uh -huh. Their actual graves are down by Fort Okay. So they were black people. Were they black slaves? They were, yeah, yeah they were called slaves. Yeah. So they were just uh, help. Uh -huh. they had, but they owned them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we've got some other. Okay. Okay, well, that, that would that would be uh, typical of my father. Can you repeat what she said? She said that uh, the morals in North Berwick, uh had slaves, and uh, they were black. This is about what you, well. Well, late 1600s, early yeah. 1700s. Yeah, yeah. yeah Don. Na nationwide had a black uh, slave girl named Black Sarah. I think was given girl. Okay, well, anyways, I guess there was some uh, history of black people, and I, this is black face people uh, on, in the in the uh, photograph that's going around. But uh, that was typical of that time period, or maybe even a little bit earlier than that. A lot of people did blackface, mm -hmm. and I'm sure my Louis, my grandfather, in the minstrel shows would see a lot, would do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that was pretty typical. Here's a picture of the barn. Uh, Got a few pictures here of the barn. Now a lot of people complained uh, a few years ago when uh, we painted the barn. It was red, if you guys remember, but originally it was white. Okay, and people said, "Why do you want? You know, it's always been red. It's always been red." Uh, it's not true. It was white, and there's proof going around. So uh, my dad was, was started quite a few theaters, and then um, in 1972 he started the Hackman Tap Playhouse. We had had cows here in the barn. <coughs> Excuse me. Up until two or three years before that. Um, during that time period, if anybody is familiar with farming and cows especially, you know, it was pretty typical through the years to have eight or ten, maybe twelve cows and, and make enough money on your sustainable farm to make it work. During the 1960s, it, got to be maybe 25, 30, or 40 cows, and then it got to be, uh, the economy of the scales were such that it got to be 50 cows pretty quickly in 60, 100, 200, probably the economy of scale now is like 500 or 600 cows, and that's a lot of investment that my dad had no interest in, uh, in doing. Uh, and he didn't have a lot of interest in getting up every morning and, and milking cows, because now they've got machinery that doesn't even require people. But Nevertheless, uh, he was doing other things at the time, really liked doing theater, loved doing theater, and I think even more, more than loved doing theater, he loved uh, getting people involved in the theater. He would always take people from whatever, whatever, uh, whatever they had for, uh, uh, for uh, talents and, and put them to work and find a place for them at the theater. So in 1972, he uh, started the Hatton Attack Playhouse. And uh, you'll see some pictures of the barn over the years. Uh, I might as well pass these over too. Oh, this is the, I missed some of this stuff. This is the, uh, you came in. Uh, I'll pass this uh, picture around that I, I missed when I am talking about Randall. He made, always made slaves. And uh, this is a picture of a, of a meat sleigh uh, that was used in one particular winter or winters, I have no idea. Uh, but uh, that's one of my relatives sitting on, on, that, on that sleigh. You'll see it as it goes around. That sleigh, in fact, is, right, is sitting right up here. Uh, you can, maybe you can see it uh, if you're sitting in that, in that direction. We move stuff up and down stairs here. I try to, you know, right? This is one area I try to keep all the actors out of. <laughs> Hard to believe that we can keep them out of something, but we cut out the stairway so nobody can go upstairs anymore. <laughs> so if we want to go up there, we have to take a ladder and take it up. But uh, the sleigh and the, the meat box, you got the meat box there? It's interesting, with the meat box is inside the house right now, we're using it as the coffee table. And, uh, but it fits on that sleigh, and I, I told Connor and my other kids that eventually, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I want the sleigh and the meat box to be reunited. Uh, Anyway, let's get a couple other pictures of, of Hackman Tack over the last few years. The Hackman Tack as, uh, oh, you know, I want to, just, just as I, uh, 
And I plucked up this. This is a, a book of Granville's. This was my great grandfather's uh, notebook. And it's, it's a little delicate, but I want to pass it around and take a look at it. You can see all the shingles he sold uh, in this particular year, which is, uh, uh, I don't know, 18, I can't read it, it's 1890, I think, maybe 1870, 1890. Uh, he's got uh, the shingles, who he sold them to, and uh, how much he made on the shingles. And it's kind of interesting, and if some of you Berwickians, you might see your relative or your father or grandfather, he sold the shingles to. And you have to go through every page. 1871. It's kind of interesting to see. That's, that's stuff I have. Uh, I have a desk in the house that's kind of been passed over, passed through the generations. And I just put different relative stuff in the different drawers. I don't know what to do with it, so I just stuff it in a different drawer. Just try to keep it, in, you know, by the time my grand, my, my grandkids will take it over, there won't be any drawers left. <laughs> I have to get a new desk. You can open up a museum. <laughs> you could. A lot of things, you know, I, that, that brings up a good story because um, I used to have, one of my ancestors had, uh, had a, uh, uh, the co one of the contracts in town to roll the roads. Maybe it was my grandfather, great grandfather, I don't know who it was, but we had a big oak roller, you know, for the slaves could go on, on, the, on the road. And we had an oak roller, and it was sitting, we sat in here for a long time. And then I said, you know, nobody could see it in here, so I brought it outside. I don't know how old it was, but it pretty much fell apart. After you kept moving it back and forth, it just fell apart. It's just made of wood, and you know, it's, it's just rotten. But it was sitting out here for quite a few years. I'm sure Ross, you remember sitting out there. Maybe some of you, the rest of you do. I was over getting my hair cut at Paul's barber shop a few years ago, and uh, Paul said to me, "You know, you should get that thing fixed. It's a really nice old piece." I said, "You know what, Paul? It is a nice old piece. I had a great idea. You." The money on it and I'll put a little you 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 pay for it I'll put a little plaque on it I'll pay for the plaque it says fixed by Paul Obama <laughs> and uh, you know come get a haircut anytime he said I don't get the money for that that's the problem I don't have the money for that either and it's hard to um, when you have a lot of these old things it's kind of hard to decide I mean none of us are uh, uh, trumping it in this room and so <laughs> We don't have the kind of money that it takes to, uh, to fix up all the stuff that we'd like to fix up. So I try to do the best I can, take care of the home place. And uh, you know, a building like this, you can see that we put a little repair into it, but it's pretty much the same old building as it was uh, uh, back in the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, Hackmatack Playhouse, as Ross uh, pointed out in his introduction, this is a big operation that we do every summer. Uh, and one of the reasons why it's such a big operation is that it starts from pretty much zero. You know, everybody goes away, does their own thing, in, you know, in September. And pretty much we put together the whole thing again every single summer. Now, obviously, we have people that come back year after year, but you can't um, depend on them absolutely because life intervenes. Ross in Maryland came and played flute and played and acted for us for years and years and years. Life intervened, people move, people come back, things happen, they have other jobs, things. <coughs> then you're not with us for a while and then sometimes you come back. And, uh, but it is a big project. It involves a lot of money, a lot of upfront money. Uh, people don't understand sometimes that the uh, shows all take uh, uh, a lot of royalties that need to be paid. You don't get these things for, for free. You pay royalties for them. Ross, yes. I, I meant to make this point just before I did my introduction, and that's that as I've experienced the theater and small town life, there's a lot of people who don't really think of a small town theater as a professional operation. They're very wrong about that. It, one doesn't have to be in a big city to do a professional job and everything about this theater is handled professionally. 
Well, I, I do appreciate that. We do. We pride ourselves in being professional. I mean, you know, we, we pay most everybody something. Uh, uh, it's, it, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of complications that go on all year long, and we try to put together a good show. Now, we don't have the resources that you're going to find at, uh, at some other theaters, but uh, in fact, uh, we had, I had a lady once, I've used this line several times, but I had a lady once who said, well, I saw that show on Broadway. This was much, much better. And I said, well, the reason it's much, much better is because we don't have the money. We have to concentrate on, on, uh, on the acting and on the uh, mu music and on the entertainment value and on the imagination. Those things, uh, I'll get to you a second. Those things uh, you can do without a lot of money. But when you're in, on Broadway, you, know, you can spend a lot of money on, uh, on uh, great, uh, great fancy moving stages and explosions and all sorts of things that we're never going to have magic that we're never going to have the money for. But, you know, people go to Broadway and they enjoy that, and that's what they see. Russ? I have a book uh, written by a, a well-known British historian of theater, and I've always loved this quote. Uh, you can hang a, uh, a single light bulb from an empty building and turn it into a theater. That's a good quote. Yeah. That's a good quote. I know uh, the first time we did, uh, well, both times we did All Shook Up, one of the greatest uh, street scenes that we had was this girl riding a stationary bicycle, you know, a, a, you know, a regular bicycle, but we fixed it up so it wouldn't go anywhere. But she was there pumping, 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 and being happy as can be. And then behind her, we had people holding a stop sign or, 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 or a cloud or, or the sun, and they were just going like this. <laughs> and, and the girls just held the bicycle and going nowhere. And we even had you know, a little kid in a, at a bus stop. You know, waiting for the bus, and the little bus stops on, the little kids, and they're all going like this. <laughs> and those little things, um, they take their imagination. They it, it make you enjoy the show, but you, you didn't need to, to do, um, you know, anything that was very, very expensive. Um, what, what can, we run out of time? It's 10 minutes of sleep. What well, can I answer some questions about the hack attack itself? I've got uh, I've got some of these here just for the, the season. Uh, please take one, and uh, we'd like to see. I know we're going to see some of you guys uh, this year, but what can I tell you, or what can what questions can I answer? Yeah. What, what the name? Where did the name come from? The hack attack is a tree. Do you guys know the difference between deciduous and, and coniferous? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the tree is a tamarack. Well, there's some debate about that. Well, yeah, I, I think habitat and tamarack are similar to it. What they all right. But what they do is they have a pine needle tree or a needle tree that sheds its needles in the winter time and turn beautifully gold. That's right. That's right. So it's that's tamarack or habitat or tamarack. Yeah. yeah. I, I so made them the lose, same. They lose their needles. They, that's correct. Right. And uh, when their needles start to fall, start to turn, they turn beautifully gold in the sunset. They're phenomenal. And are there any around here? Uh, some out in the woods. Oh. But it it looks pretty. In the middle of winter, it looks pretty much dead. Yeah. And it comes back to life. And that's what the Hackman Attack does. It looks pretty much the theater. It looks pretty much dead. <laughs> and it comes back to life every summer. Nice. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Another question? Yes, sir. How many acres do you have here now? About 175. Ooh. And how many on the, we have 35 or so on with bison right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's clear, you mean? Three yeah. Five, clear? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, another question? Yeah. Do you have any of your great new violins that he made? Uh, inside, I think we have some great, yeah. 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 So you do have they're, not, they're not in good repair, but they're, they're there. No, it's playable right now. I don't play the violin. But he plays a lot. He's all my grandfather who played a lot of instruments. He plays a lot of instruments. He also does a lot of uh, He loves to get people involved. Yeah. How many bison do you have now? Uh, bison question. How many? Uh, yeah, I was gonna jump up after this talk. Oh, okay. Do the Act Three. So this, is act, right. this is Act Two. Still on the theater. Okay. Any, any other questions about the theater? We're gonna take a tour around in a few minutes too. 
Any other questions about the theater, putting together a season? A lot of people ask me how we put together a season. And uh, it, that's, a, it, it's a, that's a good question. It's hard to do. Uh, we, we like to have different things. We like to have some new things. We like to have, we're the only theater in the area, only professional theater that uh, can do a non-musical. The Gunkle Playhouse, according to the board of directors, all musicals. So you'll see this summer we have Steel Magnolias. And uh, that's going to be a great show. It's a little niche because we'll have a, a straight show that some people actually don't like musicals. So they'll come to see something like that. Uh, we try not to repeat a show after uh, until 10 years have gone by. Uh, All Shook Up is one of those shows that we, we did uh, after we had so much success with it the first year we had it, the very next year. Uh, Sometimes we know we have good dancers and around, and so we'll tend to pick a show for the next season that has a lot of dancers. Sometimes we know we have a lot of males around, so maybe the next year we'll have a male heavy season or a female heavy season. Sometimes we have a heavy female season. What was the first show? The very first show we did here was called Ten Nights in a Bottle. And we repeated that. Uh, 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 five years after the fifth year we had that show and then uh, we repeated it at our 40th, our 40th anniversary we ran that show again with a lot of the same cast members. Can you name some of those? Yes. I was in that cast both times. The second time McConnell was in the cast. Connick played the part that I played originally. Uh, but Blaine Pickett, who uh, some of you might know, the he uh, was a star of our first show, and he came back to star in that uh, again in the 40th year. So it was kind of fun to, to be able to repeat that. Other uh, questions regarding, yeah? Where do some of the actors come from? Are they local actors, or do they come from Boston? You know, there's a lot of actors, professional grade actors that live right in the area. Hmm. There's a lot that have maybe got their, maybe have their, uh, uh, their equity card. Equity is a professional uh, actor. If you're going to be on Broadway, you have to have an equity card. A Gunko Playhouse is a full equity uh, theater. So um, that means you've, you're, it's a fully union uh, theater. Anyways, there's a lot of equity actors in the area that have uh, let their equity membership lapse because maybe they weren't getting enough, uh, enough activity or maybe they went to New York and and felt that it was just they didn't want to compete in that rat race so they've come back and maybe had families just moved on to a different kind of uh, type of life or different stage of life so we use a lot of those kind of people we use a lot of uh, uh, young uh, college type actors either from the area or from we have auditions here locally usually in Boston sometimes in New York depending on what we need and what we depending on what we need if we have a, a season that requires uh, some black people, we talked about black actors before, uh, you know, you, that's, you don't get those work there. You've got to go to New York and find a black actor. Uh, yes? So in, in doing that, I saw a sign up there that said, you know, um, homes needed. So when these actors come up here, you find homes for them yeah. to stay locally? Yeah, we try to, yeah. I've got a, a group of people, and we love it another year. Pretty much we found homes for everybody this year. But another year, you see the sign go up, give us a call. If you've got an extra bedroom, we'd love to use it up. But usually it's a, it's a great experience. It's not, uh, uh, not overwhelming at all, because they're here all the time. They're just looking for a place to sleep. So we usually we, we have a group of people in the area that take actors in. And then if we need to, we rent an apartment uh, for maybe two or three weeks of the summer. We do have a couple of apartments this year. One in, one in uh, Newington, which is really, not Newington, uh, Newmarket, a little bit too far away, but that's where we have to probably go forward. Uh, uh, another question about the hat tag before we move on to the bison part of the story, the afternoon. Uh, yes. So I don't have a question, but yep. on July 14 is Berwick Library Night, and I, it's going to be the Buddy Holly story. Yeah. So if anybody wants to have a voucher for that night, I have some. That, that's a great thing. We, what we do is we do these uh, uh, 
for different nonprofit organizations, we donate a big chunk of our nights profits to that to that uh, to that organization. So if you buy your your ticket through the Berwick Library on the 14th of July, uh, they get a, basically a $10 donation, which is pretty good. It's going to be $15. $15 donation. So good. Yes, sir. What do you do in your real life? I I still uh, I buy and sell produce. Uh, we still I, I work in I've been buying and selling produce all my life. Some of you remember the little produce stand we used to have here. We we had uh, vegetables and grew vegetables for many years, and uh, that's where I make my real money now. This is I, uh, contrary to what some people believe. I, there is no money to be made in this. This is all money that uh, we do get donations from, from people. Some people in this room donate, and we appreciate it very, very much. But uh, this is this is more of a drain than it is uh, a profit for the family. I can tell you that. But uh, it's uh, it, we feel we're doing something great for the community. It's great for the actors. It's great for the uh, for the audience. I don't know how many people have told me this is what makes their summers complete, is, is to come here in the summertime. Uh, and it's not going to last forever. It's lasted 45 years, and, and that is amazing. You're right, Ross. Uh, you know, this isn't, we're not, this may not happen forever. And finally, when our family gets completely tired of it, and it's completely overwhelming in the summertime. It, it certainly is. And, I mean, it's, it, just imagine having uh, you know, 250 people coming to your house every uh, every night during the summertime. Plus, you've got you know a cast of 40 rehearsing and a cast of 40 in the show, and concessionary concessionary people and box office people and people just coming to visit. And it takes it it gets uh, and when September comes around, uh, if we feel like uh, sometimes you do with your. Uh, with your in-laws, it's great to have them come and great to have them with Well, your blueberry pie is very good. Mm, yes. Ushers. 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 Yes. She's saying, this is our head us. This is our usher emeritus right here. And uh, she's always looking for ushers. And if any of you want to usher, volunteers. We love to have volunteers, too. So just give me a call. I'll call the box office, and we'll find a place to put you to work as a volunteer, for sure. So, okay, so I guess we're on to Connor in the bison portion of the evening. Afternoon. Okay, And we're gonna do a tour, I guess we're gonna do, talk a little bit about the bison. Then I'm gonna tour around a little bit, and then we'll probably sneak in and watch a little bit of the rehearsal. And then, uh, and then we'll walk, we'll end up on the tour down at the bison field. And then, uh, and then come back up here for some snacks. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to snack. Yeah. yeah, the bison actually are in uh, a close pasture where it's easy to get to, so you should be able to wear any foot I'm wearing Crocs, so you should, you should be fine. Before I talk about bison, however, I just need to reiterate a, a little bit about the theater. I, I grew up my, my whole childhood here doing everything from car parking. Uh, and then ushering, and then concession stand, and eventually I got into the, the shop. My dad didn't tell you, but the the old mill is now the it's it's part costume shop where we make all the costumes, and then part scene shop where we build all the sets. Mm. So I got involved there, and I got involved eventually in the pit band. Uh, Marilyn was actually my high school or my junior high <laughs> music um, teacher director, and then from the pit band on stage. Uh, and I remember one funny story where we were. We were in a total rush to put King and I out. And it was this hugely elaborate set. I mean, the, the sets are really quite phenomenal. If you, if you haven't been here before, make sure you get a chance to look at the sets. But we were rushing, and we all knew that the, the house actually opened at 7. I think, gosh, it's 5 o'clock. The set isn't even up yet, and this is the opening night. So we're rushing and rushing, and the, the stage director at the time said, look, we need a volunteer to go up in the catwalk and hang some last minute drops. This was the drop in King and I where they dropped the Siam map and they were pointing at it. And I volunteered because I was having fun. So I climbed up into the, into the catwalk and we didn't get the drop down in time. And I actually held the drop 
<laughs> during the first half of the show when I was up there for the whole first half. Uh, uh, funny story, um, what you do for theater. But the other thing I wanted to reiterate was my grandfather's heart for, for this theater. I mean, the quote he always had, and I remember, and he died when I was about 10. He used to say, if you can't sing, sing loud. <laughs> and that's a quote I always remembered. And we certainly had plenty of people here that really, they weren't singers, you know, they weren't actors, but they put their heart into it and they put their passion into it. Connor? Yeah. I sang, he sang in the choir to us at the Brewer Methodist Church. And he was a tenor, but he, he couldn't hold it. I know, I mean, he was awful. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So he, that, that, I said, well, I'll, I'll sing tenor with you. So we did. He and I sang tenor, and he said, boy, I can sing it now. Yeah. <laughs> And he really had a heart to pull in everybody from everywhere and get people involved. And you know what really happened is people found their passion and they found what they were good at. Uh, and I have seen so many of my own personal friends that I've pulled into the theater um, come to life. You know, they could have been from broken homes or just lost. And they'll come here, they, we put them in the set shop, they start making sets, or they put them on stage and they can't sing a note, but they just start acting and having fun. and. You know, sure enough, they, they found their passion and they're really enjoying life. And I think that's what it's all about. So it's a very expensive hobby, but I, I think it impacts a lot of people. And my dad has certainly embodied that as the theater has progressed. So the bison started really as a means for me to get rooted back in this landscape that I grew up in. I, I did school and then I went to undergraduate school in Nova Scotia, Canada, and I got a history degree. And then I ended up traveling quite a bit and I ended up at graduate school in Kentucky studying intercultural studies and peacekeeping and I spent years overseas teaching English, um, working in peacekeeping in Israel. But always my heart really longed to be rooted somewhere and specifically here where I had spent so much of my time and energy and life growing up and having all these memories with my cousins and close friends. So I was talking with a good buddy, a high school buddy that actually had been also transformed by this place and he wanted to go wolfing across country to bison farms does anybody know what wolfing is it's a it's a popular uh it's a popular farming approach that my generation does which is you, you go to a farm and you work for free and but in exchange for working for free you get all of this experience and you get to work alongside friends so he wanted to go wolfing across country at bison farms and i said you know what we have all this unused land. There's about 30 acres there that really isn't doing much. You know, we have a local farmer hang, or we have somebody growing corn, but for the most part, it's just sitting there. Why don't we just raise bison here? And he said, okay, and I said, okay. And, you know, we had had, we were sharing a couple beers, so we were all, <laughs> we were in a happy mood, and, and eventually we just decided to do it. And, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we, neither of us had an agricultural degree, but we decided to do bison because it was a way for us to get rooted here in this land that we love, but it was also something that would allow us to pursue our other dreams and visions at the same time. Bison is, is was quite easier than land, than livestock because there's no animal we really require. There's no vet care. There's no barn. They're wild animals that we fence in. So we were both able to explore our other dreams and family and life while also running the farm. Uh, we started in 2011. I think it's, this is our sixth year with the animals on the property. And we started the farm with three, we actually, we called it the bison project because we had no idea what we were doing. We'll just call it a project and we'll see what happens. You know, maybe it'll, come, it'll, it'll evolve into something. But we started with three core principles and I'm not gonna talk long here. I wanted to really just open it up to questions because you probably all have a million questions. But the three core principles were sustainability, we thought, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's raise beautiful animals, a beautiful product, which is bison meat, and really build the landscape. So in, invest in the soil, invest in the, the beauty of the land here, invest in our heritage. So sustainability, community. We, we really wanted to bring together community and a culture of like-minded folks to grow the culture of farming in this area. And thankfully now, uh, farming is popular. People in my age really like farming. I don't know why. It's a ton of work. <laughs> I think it's satisfying work. That's why people like it. What's that? They're satisfied doing it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's a 
and it's local. Yeah, that is local, yeah. Yeah, so develop a community. And at the time, my buddy and I were both single. Uh, we're, we now both have wives and family. So it's evolved quite a bit. Uh, but so, so sustainability, community, and then education. We really wanted to educate people about the farm and about bison in particular and about creating sustainable farmland. So those are the three core principles. Like I said, it's evolved quite a bit since then, but generally speaking, it's been very successful. We have between 20 and 30 animals right now on the farm. Specifically right now, we have 21. We fluctuate between 20 and 30 based on calving season. So we're a little low right now. Our calves haven't come in yet, but they will, in fact, any day. We might get lucky to see one out there. The first calf was actually born on my wedding day. 2012 so really special we were all we had the wedding here at the farm down by the cow pond and we were all getting ready getting dressed inside and somebody runs in on maybe my dad or a friend hey you got a calf so we're all run out there in our suits and ties and it was really special um, but we have about seven to eight calves born every year they're beautiful they're they're about 300 pounds they look like little german shepherds and they're within 20 minutes of being born they're out running around hanging out having fun so. and that's evolutionary right because the, the bison are wild needed to be strong enough to escape predators wolves and things so that's quite robust yeah. why no vet care why no vet care well there's two philosophies of regarding bison by the way, does anybody know the difference between bison and buffalo? No. Please tell. Oh. Well, the truth is there's no difference at all. It's the same thing. So, <laughs> buffalo is a nickname, um, but, or you can call them bison. Bison's their actual scientific name. There's two philosophies. One philosophy says, look, let's, uh, the, the bison were almost eradicated. There was only a few hundred left. Let's, uh, let's keep the animals wild, okay? So let's, let's grow the wild bison population and respect them as wild animals. There's another philosophy that says, look, bison is delicious, and it's a beautiful animal, and the Indians used it for everything. Let's, let's farm this animal and create an industry around it. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of right in the middle. We, we've, we've raised them for, for meat and other uses, but they're wild animals. So we don't go in there, we don't pet them, we don't ride them, and we don't do any vet care. So we've lost a few animals um, due to different issues, but at the same time, I think there's there's a real beauty in respecting the nature of the animal for for their for who they are and their natural qualities. Right behind you, Don. Um, what are your long range plans? And uh, I mean, it sounds like you do have them. And if you have long range plans, how can uh, Berwick help? Yeah. So let me can I can I skip that for a second because that's. Uh, I'm going to get to that. Right. It's a bigger, it's a bigger thing. Done. Yeah, I have a more specific question. Because you don't have vets, uh, are American bison susceptible to uh, uh, animal disease? It's very uh, dangerous for cattle, brucellosis. Yeah. Does that affect bison? Are, are bison susceptible to the same diseases that livestock are? Yes. In yeah. fact, they would be, uh, we, we were told and cautioned never to put bison with other domesticated livestock because of that specific issue. Bison in the wild ranged over thousands of miles. Here we've got a, a five or six pasture rotation set up. So we try to mimic that evolutionary yeah. roaming. Uh, we do the best we can, but inevitably they are eating grass around their own manure. And course they're susceptible to the parasites that live in the manure. Uh, so we treat them with different parasiticides like diatomaceous earth and a few of them that we keep on rotation but ultimately that's the biggest issue with bison is parasiticide. Yes? Where did you get them from? Yeah we, so great so we so we are blessed the bison community is really blessed to have significantly more demand than supply so all of the bison farmers don't feel competitive with each other. Right? And because of that, everybody has been extremely helpful. So we, we've partnered with a number of different small farms in the area that have helped from every, everything from just telling us the bison one-on-one -on -one basics to letting us buy some of their fencing or their corral system or even their animals. We bought all 13 of our original animals from two farms within 50 miles. Oh. Or 70 miles, I guess, uh, in New Hampshire. 
Isn't there a, a bison farm in uh, right near Freiburg, Maine? Uh, there's a there's a farm up that way. I don't yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. know if it's exactly Freiburg, but yeah. what do you do with the hides? Yeah, we try to use everything. He asked what we use to do with the hides. We try to use all of the animal stuff. Uh, we have we sell all of our steak cuts and ground ground meat at farmers markets, restaurants in the area. For example, Seventh Settlement in Dover, Thistle Pig down here in Southborough carries our stuff once in a while. Burger Bar in Portsmouth carries all of our bison meat and a number of others. We sell soap from the tallow, that, that, or that raw suet, really. We, we render it and make soap, which is fantastic. The hides we try to sell. Um, my business partner, when we started, actually tried to tan them himself. And it's, it's just messy. I don't know if anybody's done that before. There's a tannery in downtown. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Shoot. <laughs> you put you your own? No, we don't. No, everything's USDA certified. All of our meat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have, it's a business. So to, to answer, to go back to your question, uh, the question was, what, are, what, what, is that, what does the business look like, or what are we doing with the farm? Well, again, we, we sell about seven or eight animals off of our farm here. And we do everything from farmer's markets to restaurants, wholesale. We invite people to buy shares of animals so we can sell a whole animal or a half or a quarter share. In fact, I have some available if anybody's interested today. Um, and then we can sell live animals too, which is, there's quite a demand for live animals. Bison is... He wouldn't fit in my front yard. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, you need a few acres. Yeah. Uh, but bison is in extremely high demand. So the, the, the issue has not been um, building up a clientele for the meat. The issue has been keeping enough meat on hand. So we've actually partnered with some other gentlemen farms in northern Maine and New Hampshire that have much larger acreage and have the time and energy to do it right to, to buy animals from them and then actually distribute them to the restaurants in the area. So we, so back to your point, so only about 20% of the business part of our farm now is our, our own animals. We've evolved so much that we're, we're gathering animals from all over the Maine and New Hampshire. We're probably the largest distributor of grass-fed bison meat now in, in New England, I guess. That's quite a niche, certainly. What do you lack to expand then, or do you want? Do you want? To? Yeah, so we would love to expand. Again, we only have about 30 acres here, and we've maxed out our, our size, about 30 animals. So we we talked in the past about working with the local land trusts to see if there's a way to use the land to raise bison. Um, it requires a lot, a lot of time and energy. Just like my dad, I, I like to work two jobs too. So I have I have a I, I have another job on the side. So this is like two full time jobs. More or less. You had some buffalo hair. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. So I wanted to just show you here, not to get into too much detail, but bison are just majestic creatures. I, I'm looking forward to showing you guys because they're just beautiful. I mean, there's there's been times where you have, a, you have a tough day, or I have a tough day, and I you drive your truck out back and get away from like, the road and all the buildings, and you're just alone with the animals. And they're Do they allow you to walk amongst them? I could, yeah. I, I tend not to, just because mm. you you wouldn't want to get kicked. I mean, no. mm. they're just so so big, you know. Yeah. One slip. And they smell too. They don't smell too no. bad. No, they're, they're, they're quite. Smell. Yeah. What's the average weight? Um, uh, my bull Winston is about a ton, two thousand pounds. Wow. But the average female cow is probably fifteen or sixteen hundred pounds. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I was saying they're just majestic animals, and it really it really is amazing that you can use all these different parts of the bison. Is it soft? This, the bison down um, sheds, it's tough to get because you can't, you can't go and like break it off of them, or comb it off. So I just picked some of this stuff up. They're shedding now. Um, and bison hair, the bison down is finer than cashmere. And the problem though is that it doesn't it doesn't dye very well. So unless you like this brown color, <laughs> it's hard to really kind of hard to make a fashion statement. But there's also there's a, there's three different fibers types of hair in there down. So you have to pick out the different fibers. I just wanted to show you show this to you. It takes a quite a skilled person to pick those fibers out and really create a create something nice out of it. But it's a beautiful product. 
can they be pets? Are they? They can be pets. They can be domesticated to a certain degree. They get like attached to they. Yep. They know you. They know me. Absolutely. They have wonderful personalities. I've got a girl named Buttercup up there. Yeah. I think my dad actually is one of the original ladies, and she's little. She never really grew to be full size. But she, every time I go up there, she comes over and stands right up at the fence with her cute little face. You'll see her when you go out there. And what do they eat? Just grass? Yeah, so my bison eat just grass. And that's really going back to one of our mission statements for this farm. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do it right. And bison should be eating grass. You know, they shouldn't, really shouldn't be eating grain. A lot of people finish their animals with grain just like livestock. But they're ruminants, so they've got four stomachs and they process grass. With them eating just grass, they find the fat content less than they do with the feed and grain? Absolutely, you know, absolutely. Fat content is lower, but in general, bison meat is leaner than beef. And when people eat bison, they're looking for that meat and steak and meat burger. I, I think that's what makes it. Yeah, uh, do you ever uh, fall in love with one and then it will never become somebody's supper? No. <laughs> oh, I like buttercup. Because oh. <laughs> hay is expensive, you know, you're buying all this hay. And Just thought I'd check. They're not pets. <laughs> <laughs> they're pets. Uh, they all have butterflies in their eyes and stuff. They have yeah. a good time to Are they bothered by flies? You'll see when we get out there. <laughs> yeah, they are, but. You can't do anything. We try. Yeah, we try, but we don't want to spray anything. There is a, there is a, a, not a chemical, but it's an actual uh, powder you can put in the water. And it doesn't say stay in their system, it, it goes out of their system, but it keeps the flies away. Okay. Yeah. And I know there's it, a lot. you know RFD TV? You ever watch that? Uh, I think so. I think I have, yeah. It's on there that they can tell you what to use for, for steers, car, buffalo, anything you let, any animal. You use that in their water or in their feed, and it takes care of the flies. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, I'll check it out. So, Colonel, uh, we yeah. have <coughs> about two stages left to do, <coughs> and your dad's going to take us through. Yeah, that's good. Kind of the seal, and then we'll head down. So, what, like what we'll do, Roland? Yeah, you can ask. You can ask me questions as we yeah, walk, we'll walk around. Yeah, So, what we'll do for a little tour? I'll. Uh, uh, first of all, let me tell you, all the houses in this area uh, were built by family members. Many of them are, are still family members, cousins. My, my brother lives next door. My sister lives down the road a piece. My nephew's here. My cousin's over here. My Over here, uh, there's a big, where the daycare center is? Yes. That used to be a chinchilla ranch. My, my, uh, my aunt used to run chinchillas. And there were two or three other buildings just like that one. And she raised chinchillas and minks uh, for quite a few years. Uh, so anyways, we'll, we'll take a walk through. I don't know if anybody wants to go through the box office. You can see all the posters for many, many years. Going to there, you can see my dad's hats. All his, he's got his theater hat, his cowboy hat, his, his farming hat, they're all in there. Then we'll go to the back of the barn um, very quietly because I've got a rehearsal going on. Just kind of to poke your head in and watch the rehearsal. Then we'll show you the shop over here and maybe go backstage and then maybe go, uh, maybe go up to the bicycle. Okay? And come back. England's most charming and unique. It's got the, uh, <laughs> the box office. I think the tickets were $3 a piece, I think. It's got a map in here. My, my father used to run this, uh, this ad in the paper and they used to say, um, uh, you know, 10 minutes from Durham <laughs> at, at, 90, at 90 miles an hour in the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so let's go sneak in the back of the theater. All right, we're going to be quiet. Okay. Yeah. I was in your way. You could have said something.
I was going to say, it's, it's kind of amazing when you live at this theater, or any, if you were to live at any theater, because, you know, I, I, yeah, I wake up and go to sleep with this kind of music all the time. It could be, uh, it could be, you know, Richard Rodgers, it could be, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Soundheim, it could be, uh, you know, Leonard Bernstein music, and then uh, it's so interesting to think that you're working with artists all the time. I mean, in this building, they usually have, they might have a dance crew working, and, and then in here, they're creating all sorts of different things. And these guys are so imaginative and create, can create something out of nothing, which is really what we do in the theater is create something out of nothing. I mean, sometimes there's a, there's a script, obviously, we start with. But uh, so this building here, you can take a peek. This is the uh, shop that we use to build the sets. Upstairs, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd love to bring you up there, but it's just too complicated to get you all up the stairs and everything. Up the, upstairs is a full costume lot for costumes that we've collected for years. If there's two or three you want to go up, I can bring you up. It's just hard to get everybody up to the back of the building upstairs. And I guarantee it's extremely hot up there today. Are there any costumes that you need? You know, the, um, are you always lacking we, we, certain things? Uh, people always want to give us things, and some things we use all the time. If you have anything that's like uh, for a twin or a triplet, exactly the same or very, very similar, use that stuff all the time. Uh, you know, if, you've got, if you're cleaning out your attic, you've got a lot of clothes from the 1940s, we've got a lot of that already, because a lot of other people have cleaned out their attics before you got around to it. Uh, but specialty clothes, special, real special costumes, kids' special outfits, things that are really different we can use. But in here is uh, where the costume mist mistress does her work. These are costumes that are probably lined up for this show uh, for She Loves Me. So, do you have a seamstress on hand, or? Uh, well, we've got a, a, a girl who's head of the costumes for the for the for the season, mm -hmm. and then we have different people that come in to work for those particular shows. Oh, okay. Now, this is this is a, a mill that my grandfather hooked up. We used to have an Alice Chalmers B tractor that we bought over Brackett and Shaw, and uh, we used to drive it in here. And if you come in here, you can see the. See the, oh, yeah. the power yeah. that the power used to hook up a belt, and the whole thing would run on a belt system. Basically, in in uh, you know he took the the same um, kind of skills that he would use in a in a in a water mill and just put it to work off the tractor, which worked a lot easier. So this whole all the saws in here and the uh, the planers and everything that he would use would all work off from tractor power. Uh, we probably go through a few sewing machines, <laughs> and then back here, we'll see if we can cut through the uh, the dressing room. It's kind of interesting. Could be very interesting. Could be. When you go this way, you'll see the Alice Chalmers tractor that's gone through quite a life change. <laughs> that was a tractor that was bought at Bracken and Shaw. And we wore it out completely on the farm. It was, it was taken to, taken to uh, Lebanon. What was the guy's name, Paul? Bud Bourne. Bud, Bud Bourne, right, right. Who we'll fixed it all up and ran to some tractor shows. Ended up at, at Paul's house, who uh, got it back to the original farm. So it's, it's gone around. We, we use it all the time. Again, if we go backstage, just be quiet, because they, they do have the rehearsal going on. My dad always calls it the little pasture, but it's actually an old sand pit, so the soil quality is like nothing. But we like to winter them in there, and we're trying to slowly grow the soil quality. 
Let's walk back. The waiter, they're pretty.